Persecution of Christians is greater than it's ever been. It is estimated that 300 Christians are killed every day for their faith. More people have been martyred for their faith in the last two centuries than they have in all the other centuries combined. We have decided to take time this morning and pray for the Church of Nigeria. Rob and Jerry Sullivan are here and are going to take a moment to share their uh, experience. Hi there, good morning. We are the Sullivans, I'm Rob and this is Jerry. And uh, we're here because we lived in Nigeria for a couple of years, um, in 2010 and 2011. Um, Rafiki Foundation is uh, a home to orphans. Uh, we have a student, uh, an education program, a, a classical Christian school curriculum, and we do teacher training there. Um, you know, while we lived there, we saw a number of things. You know, we, everyone we met had lost someone to violence. Many of our children uh, in the village uh, witnessed the mayhem that made them orphans. Um, some of them bore the scars of that. And so, you know, it was just, just kind of a reality. But we'd uh, like to talk a little bit about uh, the nature of persecution in Nigeria, what's going on in Nigeria. I'll let Jerry explain that, and then I'll come back around and tell you about a few of our friends that we touched base with uh, this week and uh, their prayer requests, their praises, uh, some things that we can pray for. Hi. So yes, uh, Ryan asked us to speak about uh, per the persecuted church in Nigeria, and not only do you have a uh, does this church have a connection to Nigeria through us, but we also support a missionary there, uh, Stephen Bahago, who uh, was trained by George Verkaik's brother, Peter Verkaik, there in Nigeria, in the same part of the country that we lived in. So we have a number of connections to that country just directly from Trinity Church. Um, and we do still work for the Rafiki Foundation, its headquarters, its U.S. headquarters is in Eustis, Florida, nearby here. So um, we're happy to talk to you more about come that. Come and see us if you like. Yeah, come and see us. I'll give you a tour, or Rob will. <laughs> so, um, and, and as Rob said, we spoke this week with uh, some of our missionary friends who still live in Nigeria, as well as uh, in the last couple months, this last week, and before that, to some church officials from the area of Nigeria that we were in. So we have some reports for them. But basically, Nigeria, as you see there, is in Africa. It is uh, number 14 on the Open Doors watch list of the most difficult countries to live in as Christians. Unlike the worst five countries that you saw in the video, Nigeria does not have an official government policy of persecuting or suppressing Christianity. However, persecution there is very severe and it's very widespread. The population of Nigeria is about 200 million people, and you saw in the video there about 215 million people, uh, Christians worldwide, face persecution. Well, half of Nigeria's population is Muslim and the other half is Christian, so there are about 100 million Christians just in the country of Nigeria that face systemic persecution. Um, the area where we work and where our missionary Stephen Bohago is, is in the middle of the country uh, called Jos, uh, a city called Jos. But the northern half of Nigeria is pretty much all Muslim and mostly under Sharia law. The southern half of the country is Christian. And where we worked and where uh, Stephen works uh, and where Peter Verkaik worked is in the middle. So right between those, it's kind of at the fault line between the Muslim north and the Christian south. And uh, the Muslims would like to take over the whole country of Nigeria. Islam spreads through conquest and uh, under Islam, any area that was once under Islam and no longer is, which all of Nigeria once was, is considered a disgrace to the prophet. And so there is a, a concerted effort to make all of Christ, uh, Nigeria Mus uh, Muslim. So um, you've probably heard of Boko Haram. That's the uh, group that's affiliated with Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And they operate mainly in the northeastern part of Nigeria. They're the ones that kidnapped all the schoolgirls that we heard about and, and that kind of thing. And they're they're still there, and they're still even down in Jos, but they're not quite as uh, prevalent as they were as ISIS has begun to loss, uh, lose some power. The main threat right now to most of the Christians in Nigeria in that middle part of the country are from uh, Fulani Muslim militants. The Fulani are a, a, tri a nomadic tribal people that live all throughout North Africa, and they are Muslim. And most of the Christians in Nigeria are farmers. And so you'll hear sometimes, if this is at all uh, mentioned in the news here, that these are clashes, tribal clashes between uh, herders and farmers. And that's not really the whole story. It's really a religious clash. And it's not really even a clash because the Christians are not clashing with the Muslims. The Muslim Fulani are coming into Christian villages 
destroying homes, churches, burning them down, and killing every Christian inhabitant that they can find. In the past, the Fulani just had sticks. They were cattle herders, but now they have AK-47s and grenades and all kinds of sophisticated weapons that they bring in from Libya, Syria, and Iran, and uh, have, have killed just in the last six months, just in the that middle part of Nigeria, over 1,200 Christians have been killed by Fulani militants. So that's the situation there, and um, that's, uh, oops, I just lost my notes. <laughs> and so I'm gonna let Rob tell you now some, some stories from kind of the front lines there that we've heard from our missionary friends there and also from church leaders there. Thanks. Uh, let's see, the picture here is uh, of our friends Randy and Adina Wildman. Uh, we met them while we were in Jos. They've served there for a long, long time with SIM, serving in missions, a, a big African missions organization. Um, we knew that uh, Adina was involved in post-trauma counseling. Randy and Adina would go into small villages, small churches where many had been killed, the churches had been burned. They would be among the first to come alongside, you know, those ones that had lost loved ones, uh, to encourage them, to listen to them, to cry with them, but also to deepen their understanding of the gospel, uh, to bring about uh, healing and restoration and uh, to rebuild. Uh, Randy is involved in discipleship ministry and Adina education and uh, post-trauma counseling. We knew that a couple years ago that they had moved from Jos, where we were, uh, up to a place called Kano, uh, a town uh, up in the north with six million Muslims. And uh, they were very pleased to tell us that they feel very safe there. Uh, they're in San Diego this week, and uh, they're hearing about some of the things that have happened here in the U.S., and they wonder how we deal with it. Uh, but they, uh, they're involved now. Uh, they've continued the discipleship ministry. They're involved uh, in an English as a second language class for Muslims. And they said it's, it's just ideal when half of the class is new believers and the other half is Muslims. They just pour themselves into those people and they explain words like forgiveness and reconciliation and mercy, you know, it becomes an opportunity to explain the gospel and it's bearing much fruit. They also, you know, they've just poured their lives into discipleship. As I talked to Stephen Bahago, uh, what I learned was that uh, Stephen also was discipled by, Rand by Randy. Uh, he spent a semester in one of Randy's discipleship classes so that connection just abounds. Uh, Randy and Adina know Stephen uh, and his wife, uh, the new Peter and Betty Verkaik as well. Um, they told us of another of their mentees who has a ministry in Jos, uh, again, reaching out to Muslims. They told us specifically about a pastor uh, whose church had been burned out in Miango. Okay, Miango is the place where Peter Verkaik founded Word of Life Ministries. It was just west of us. Our, our Rafiki village was on Miango Road west of Jos. Uh, we bought meat in Miango and uh, we had tailors to make school uniforms that were in Miango too. Um, but this pastor's church had been burned out. He'd lost his family. He was bitter. He was angry. Uh, he had somehow gotten a gun and it was his intention to go after the Muslims that had destroyed uh, his church and his village. But he got connected with this ministry in Jos. And after 10 sessions of hearing the gospel afresh and hearing the gospel anew, um, he set aside the gun, he got rid of it, and his desire is to bring the gospel to Muslims. And this is what happens in this trouble, that, you know, there's trouble, there's prayer, God answers prayer by, being, by bringing faithful people. Um, faithful people make disciples, disciples bring other disciples, and change comes about. And so, you know, this pastor will go and rebuild that church in Miango, I'm sure, I wouldn't be surprised if Peter and Beggy, Betty Verkike might even know this pastor uh, since they live there as well. Miango's not a big place. So we were greatly encouraged uh, to talk to Randy and Adina. They told us that the persecution now uh, in Nigeria, even in the north, is not so much just violence and mayhem. There's, it still erupts into that often enough, but it's just discrimination. Uh, the Christians in the north have the most lowly jobs. They have the dirtiest water. Their electricity isn't turned on. Uh, it's just life is hard. But they said that they're very much buoyed up by the knowledge that we're praying for them. They're greatly encouraged. And, you know, God is moving in their midst. And the strength and uh, just the, the power of the faith that's growing in those churches is, is pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. It's something that we should long for. 
something that we should long for. Um, last, you know, uh, Randy and Adina were just overjoyed when we told them about Stephen uh, because they know him. Um, I talked to Stephen this week, and uh, he just he brings his thanks and uh, his greetings. He wanted me to share his greetings uh, with all of us. His ministry is growing. Since he uh, was here last, he said he had 10 staff at that time. He has a, a ministry in Joss and then also in a place called Kaduna. He told me where his building is in Joss in Rayfield, and I know where that is. Um, it's on the road out to the airport. Um, but his, his ministry has grown to 18 people and uh, 18 staff, 18 staff, and they're directly involved in evangelism to Muslims, to Fulanis. Uh, they're all around Joss and around Kaduna. His, his bold vision that God has given him is to reach the 200 plus thousand people who have been displaced uh, from the north, who have moved south. They're all around Joss and, and Kaduna. Uh, he has a five year vision. He said that he'd been fasting this week for five days came off the fast, he was just very aware of their need for prayer support. Um, this, we've heard from multiple people that this is a time of danger uh, in Nigeria. The presidential elections are coming up again in uh, February. Uh, usually there's, there's two terms of a president from the north, which means a Muslim president, and then two years of a president from the south. So this will be the second term of a Muslim president that's coming up. But as the elections approach, the tensions rise, what we knew in, you know, while we lived there was that it would be a time when gas stations would stop selling petrol because they didn't want people throwing petrol bombs. The cell phones would shut off because they didn't want rioters to organize. Um, and we would just hunker down. We'd see smoke on the horizon. Um, one Christmas morning, we heard a bomb go off. We, or, uh, Chris, uh, Christmas Eve, before Christmas morning, we had decided not to go into town uh, that next morning because of the troubles. And as we were doing our Christmas Eve service, we heard a bomb go off and found out later it was in the Koken Church in a place called Kabang where we took some of our kids uh, every week. So that violence is near. When I talked to Stephen, he told me that he was um, in Kaduna um, a few weeks earlier and we could probably find this news item, but a Kaduna tribal chief was kidnapped. And um, 16 people died in the place where he was kidnapped uh, with gunfire. And Stephen was in the car with his wife and kids meters away from where this happened. They witnessed the whole thing. And he's very aware of God's protection, very thankful, for, again, for our prayers, because he believes that, that the angels just protected him and preserved him uh, for this ministry. So he's thankful, thankful for that. Uh, he wanted us just to pray as he came off of this fast. He saw the phone call even as a, a confirmation of his prayers and the bold vision that he has continued just to pray that the workers would remain faithful. You know, even though they anticipate trouble, remain faithful, stay the course, be quick and ready with the gospel, and uh, look forward uh, to the victory uh, that will come out of it, even, even if there's trouble. So that's how we pray. Thank you. Thank you. Mm Thank you, Rob and Jerry, and uh, thank you for taking the time to do this. And we're going to explain um, and pray for Nigeria specifically, but we're going to pray for all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to greet you in the name and, and, uh, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Ryan Schmitz, in case you've forgotten, uh, that uh, the pastor here at the church. And uh, it's great to be back. Uh, it's been, it was just a really fun um, experiment that we did with these other churches. It's just fun to be back. If you're just joining us, um, we did this series with five other pastors who got together and just talked about a different distinctive of the Evangelical Free Church. Um, and uh, we took those passions and we went to each other's churches and we just shared in fellowship and we spoke together and we pastor swapped. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. Um, we had a great time with it. It was, a, it was a great experience. We're glad to have been going through it. Um, and, uh, you know, we just, we're just glad that we're here now uh, celebrating the Lord uh, together. So um, 
this entire series that we did was born out of a desire to pray for each other and to be unified. And that's really the heartbeat of our church, the heartbeat of the EFCA. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today, very fittingly, on the International Day of Prayer. Uh, and that is just the power of prayer. Um, the series that we did it may turn into a national movement within the Evangelical Free Church, which is really exciting. Um, it started all here in Central Florida. We're, we were kind of a a prototype for them. Um, some of the, uh, at first there was some initial fear and skepticism. I heard some of you guys telling me, hey, listen, don't get too comfortable going to those other churches because we want you here. Um, and I said, yeah, I get that. That's really good. Um, I even heard uh, people say, just don't like those other churches. Uh, someone told me that too. However, those fears went away when we started to connect with each other. We started to realize that they're, we're all on the same team um, and we got this incredible experience. We had the same worship, only with different songs, the same word of God, only in a different region, the same spirit of God, only with different faces. It was really a blessing. Um, every church, they told me to say to the pastors, told me to say, listen, I wanted to thank all of you that hosted us while we were at these different churches. Um, they said they had great experiences going out to lunch with you, um, going and help the audio people were fantastic. Um, the, the, the actual impressions that the churches had were very encouraging. Um, some people said that it was refreshing to see how the churches came together in a culture that's so polarized today, which I thought was really cool. Um, I heard someone say, wow, I've really learned a lot about the EFCA that I didn't know about before, and now I, even, I love the church even more. Um, I heard someone just you know, get real honest and say, hey, I like judging the other pastors and their styles. You know, I thought, you know, someone had to say it because I know we were all doing it. Uh, we were like, you know, America's got pastors here. And uh, you guys were all like Simon, Simon Cowell and Mel B out there deciding which one's better. Uh, but I like, I like Fred's testimony too. He just said, you know, looking at all these pastors, it's nice to know that the Evangelical Free Church in Central Florida is in good hands um, because we have godly people that have dedicated themselves to serving um, in the kingdom and in pastoral work. It's just awesome. Um, the pastors walked away saying, wow, we felt really the pride uh, and the, the weight of privilege standing in each other's pulpit. Uh, and it was really encouraging. It was humbling to hear other pastors say kind words about you. Um, I, most of the churches I went to were actually warned about me. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't actually encouraged. They were like, hey, watch out for this guy. Um, but that's okay. And I heard there's some comments said here of me while I was gone. You know, what can I say? Um, but anyway, uh, they, they all got together and said, okay, what's next for us? Uh, what do we want to do? And I just, I just said to them, what can't we do as believers in Christ when we unite together? We're just better together. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to do some more stuff. We're going to start dreaming for the future. But really, we're going to start in the same place that we started with this series. And we're going to start with prayer. We're going to lift up our eyes to God and ask God to direct us. That's the beauty and the greatness of prayer. You know, I used to say, I believe in the power of prayer. Um, but I've stopped saying that because I've started, and I've started saying, I believe in the power of God. And so because of that, I like to talk to him a lot. You know, and it's not quite as catchy, um, but it really focused me, focuses me in on to why I pray, why I'm lifting up my heart to God. And before we take time to pray for the persecuted church, I just want us to look quickly at what God's word says as to why we should pray. You're going to be blessed by this. By the way, there's so many verses about prayer in scripture that that because of that, you know, I just, I couldn't cover it all. I actually left you a whole page of just verses and references that you can look at that will bless you for praying in your personal prayer life. But you're going to be blessed this morning, um, and this will be a benefit to you. But I like to start with the major reason, the major reason why we ought to pray is that God tells us to pray, okay? God tells us to pray. Oh, here are those guys. Here's, here's all the pastors. Stephen's sitting in a hole, I think. He's got his feet... I don't know why he's so low there. Um, but God tells us to pray. Here's what, here's what uh, he tells us to do. As God tells us to pray, we understand that prayer is an act of obedience and reliance on God. All right? That's the truth. That's the first reason. We really don't need any other reason than this. If God tells us to do it, we should do it. 
But this is what God's word says. Romans 12, 12. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. And then it says to pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And again, it says, don't be anxious about anything. God says, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And that's what God did for us. That's the example God has given to us. Another reason why we should pray is prayer is how we communicate with God. It's how we talk to God. And think about that for a second. You and I have the opportunity to talk to God Almighty, the creator of the universe. It's amazing. Jeremiah says this, when you call on me and come and pray to me, I will listen to you. How exciting is that? Every day we're praying for God to reveal his will, his will to us. It's very, very exciting. Okay. Um, Prayer positions us to participate in God's work. Prayer positions us to participate in God's work. When we look at Matthew and we see God giving us this prayer example on how we should pray, one of the lines he says is, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Well, how do we know what's going on in heaven that his will should be done here on this earth? We lift our voices, and when we pray to God, it orients ourselves like a compass, and it points us true north to get things done in the ministry. I'll tell you guys that nothing gets done here at Trinity without first bathing it in prayer. That's what we do as leaders. That's what I do as a pastor. That's what I do this morning, just spending an hour or so just saying to God, take this service and use it. Speak to these people. Be Use my words, use the word of God, anoint this place to speak to us. Everything happens through prayer. Prayer Prayer reminds us that God is with us. That's important because we lose sight of that from time to time. We remember that at that great commission that God gave us at the very end of that, he says, listen, behold, I am with you to the very end of the age as we go out and we minister We need to turn and stop and turn to God. In times of trouble, prayer stops us from trying to figure stuff out on our own and helps us to turn to God. When you guys are in trouble, when there's a chaos in your life, when there's a struggle in your life, is prayer the first thing that you go to or is it the last ditch effort when everything else is well? I'm guilty of the latter. I'm guilty of going, oh, you know what? Maybe I should have prayed for this a month ago instead of going through all of this headache, right? It reminds us that God is with us. Prayer strengthens the bonds between believers. Has anybody ever experienced that? Has anybody ever had a family of believers come around them and pray for specific requests in their life, a specific moment in their life, and people came around you and they just lifted up their hearts and they cried for you and they they asked God on behalf of, of their hearts and their spirit to help you in whatever situation it is? Isn't that incredible? It's an amazing thing, and it it binds us together. The Bible says, pray for one another, invest in one another through prayer. I love this one. Prayer fulfills emotional needs. Prayer fulfills, are anybody emotionally unbalanced here this morning? (laughs) Now, spouses, please don't point and stare at your other, at your spouses, okay? That's not fair. I just saw someone point. That was not right. (laughs) Lucas. No one's, no one's looking at you. No, <laughs> Prayer fulfills emotional needs. Listen, what the Bible says is when he says, when he says, cast your cares upon Christ. What is that? What are the cares of our world? These are these emotional needs, these anxieties, these fears, these, 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 these questions. When God says, take your burdens and give them to me, I'll exchange them for rest He wants to bring you that emotional stability. I like what C.S. Lewis says. He says, God has designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel of our spirits. We're designed to burn. Our food for our spirits we're designed to feed on. There is no other. Guys, prayer can succeed when all other means have failed. It's God's remedy for the world. It's important for us to understand this, that this is God's remedy for life. 
There are testimonies in this room that I know that you could stand and say, it is because of prayer that I am here today. Do you know that this church is a direct result of prayer? That this church was founded on prayer. And in fact, if you were to go all the way back to Jesus' time in the ministry and you see John 17, you see Jesus himself praying for this church, saying, God, sanctify them in the truth. Let them be one as I, as you and I are one. Be with the generations that are coming before me. Make, let them represent who I am. I mean, this goes on and on and on. I bet you, you and I could testify today that you are a direct result of prayer. I can stand here today and say, I am here in this position this morning out of a direct result of godly people praying for me for years and years. How many of you have that? How many of you know that there is that godly grandma or that godly mom or that godly dad, or that godly mentor, or that pastor, or that small group that said, I am going to pray for this person. And you can stand and say, listen, I testify that it's because of prayer and because of God's work through prayer that I'm here today. There's so many testimonies on that. And in fact, two weeks ago, I was, heard, I was told a tremendous testimony with uh, Dennis and Eileen. And they, they sat down and they told me about a trip they went on. And they told me about what they had experienced. And I was just floored by this amazing answered prayer. And I said, Eileen, would you be willing to just share that and bless the whole church with the testimony of prayer? And she's like, yeah, I sure will. And so I've asked her today to come and just share this experience they've had. I know we all have got these, but I want, I want you to hear Miss Eileen. Miss Eileen would you come up and would you guys give Miss Eileen a warm welcome and love on her because this is not easy to do. I give this to you. Thanks, Eileen. I'll, <laughs> I'll be praying for you. First of all, I want to thank Suzanne for laying a foundation this morning in Sunday school class. She said everything I'm going to say. So if you were there, I hope this blesses you. Carl Harlan was my uncle. He had beautiful, transparent, ice blue, smiling eyes and beautiful white hair. He was a wild one, not a bad one, but pretty wild. He was the youngest of three kids born to my Westland straight-laced pastor grandparents. He fit the image of the PK, preacher's, preacher's kid, on every level. He was rebellious, he drank, he smoked, he liked fast women, and he liked faster cars. Carl was 10 years older than I was, and I saw him as the big brother that I never had. I followed him around like a puppy. I spent summers with my grandparents, and on Wednesday night, we had prayer meeting. We knelt at hard wooden pews, and we talked to God for over an hour. I loved hearing my grandmother pray. At her side, I learned to shout amen and praise the Lord before I even really ever knew who Jesus was. She loved the Lord, and never did I hear her pray that she didn't ask that God would touch the hearts of her two sons, Lee and Carl. My grandmother was the best. She knew I needed her. God knew that I needed her. She loved me no matter what, and she told me that I had value. Nobody else saw me that way. She taught me how to clean and how to keep house. She taught me to be a lady, to dress well, to do the right thing, and how to care for others. And she loved missions. But most important, she lived her truth, and Jesus was part of her every day. My grandmother died 40 years ago. This is very important. She died 40 years ago. And I remember thinking, who will pray for Lee and Carl? Now, I may be slow, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> of course, it was me. I had done all I could do to share what Jesus had done with me, for me, with Carl. Heaven knows, Carl gave me lots of opportunities. When he was in a crisis, I would go I would write letters, and I would even ask others to go. But remember, Carl grew up in a Christian home. He was bathed in love. He knew and he heard the truth often. His answer was always the same. 
Eileen, it's not for me. No. I visited him just a while ago, and I asked him again, Carl, I just want to know that you're going to be in heaven. Please. He turned those crystal blue eyes to mine, strokes having all but stripped him of his speech, and he said, no, I won't. I continued to storm heaven for Carl's salvation, and I ask many of you to pray, and thank you, you have a part in this story. A few weeks ago, I got that dreaded phone call. You know the one. You've all received it. Can you come? Time is growing short for Carl. Now, I'm in Florida, and Carl is in Syracuse, New York. As I mentioned earlier, my grandfather was a Wesleyan pastor. We spent every summer at our church camp. It was the one place on earth where the world just couldn't touch you. It was holy ground. And in the evening, we would sit huddled in blankets around a campfire. It was New York, you know. And even one fourth of July, it snowed. We sang and we praised God under the stars. Yes, we prayed for each other. And in that circle were my grandparents and a new young buck of a preacher that had just come into the conference named Fred named Frank Thomas. He came with his precious wife, and they had such a passion for saving souls for the Lord, and they came with their own set of PKs. A young Frank Thomas II and a daughter. Again, keeping this timeline in your mind, that was over 40 years ago. Frank Thomas II was their Carl. Now, truly making this story short, Frank Thomas II became my son-in-law. Yes, you heard that right. And Pastor Ryan, that story could keep you in sermon material for a month. God does have a sense of humor. And Frank, II, Frank Thomas II is the father of six of my grandchildren. And yes, one is named Frank Thomas the third, pray for me. <laughs> uh, Frank, unlike Carl, he did the wild thing for sure, but then he made the right choice. God is a God of redemption. Frank Thomas, my son-in-law, is now a pastor of a church and involved in a ministry for motocross racing. He now shares what God has done for him with other people. Now, I know that's complicated. Have you got all of that? So when the call came, I asked Frank Thomas Sr. to go talk with Carl again. He had done that before. He said, yes, I'll go. He told Carl very simply, hey, buddy, you and I are not getting any younger. Soon we're going to be standing before God. And Carl, you already know the drill. There isn't anything new I can say to you. But Carl, you are worthy of heaven. God knows you. He knows all you've done. And he loves you anyways. Carl, are you ready to pray? And Carl looked at him with pleading blue eyes, indicating that he could no longer speak. And Frank said, Carl, the answer's in you. And Carl looked at him, and he spoke, yes. Frank waited to let the truth sink in, because after all, this was a pretty important matter. And Carl again said, yes. Frank texted me a little text, and it said, praise the Lord, sister. Now, I would like to tell you that I rejoiced and I danced. You see, I do know who God is. I do believe that he would do that for you. But for me, I got a little doubting Thomas in me. I wanted to touch the nail scars so we flew to Syracuse. 
I walked into the hospital room, and yes, death was in the air. And I said, Carl, I heard you made a decision. Is that true? Carl, feebly but clearly, said yes. After a lifetime, a lifetime of no, God stood waiting, whispering his love and giving the redemption that he promises. That's who God is. Carl constantly cried in the last few years. He was filled with hope and unworthiness, but now there was calm in that room. It was an anointed waiting by a deathbed. You see, the Holy Spirit makes a distinct difference. And Carl went home in peace. Amen. I know many of you well, and I know this story doesn't always turn out that way. But God allowed this as he does everything for one reason. So at this moment and at this time, he will be glorified. It is who he is loving us when we say no, hmm. when we walk on the wild side. And it doesn't happen just in a moment. He took my grandmother's life, her living out the every day of who her God was, never giving up, dying without her son accepting salvation. And that wouldn't happen for 40 years. God knew the end. I continued in faith, praying, but walking my walk with doubt, I will admit. Yes, you can believe, but doubt. God loves you anyways. God was in that campfire, Christians coming together, talking about him with those naughty little rugrats sitting in the shadows, doing their own naughty little things. Years and years and years and years, and nothing, nothing happened. Or so it seemed to us. But God, hear this, sweet friend. Don't give up. Ask others to share the battle in your prayers. It makes a difference. It really does. Our hands are tied. We love our family and our friends so much, and yet nothing seems to happen. If you hear nothing else, hear this sentence. God may tie your hands, but you bend your knee. Amen. God may tie your hands, but you bend your knee. We think we are the hands of God, so we must do and do and do and do and do, and a crisis arises, so we immediately try to figure out, what should I do? I must do something, and some of you are running around, running yourself into the ground, trying to help the world. Bless you. I'm sorry, but you can't fix anything. Understand that. Instead, drop to your knees. Ask the God that can really help you. Listen for that simple one little thing that the Father tells you to do. And then stand up and obey. Do that one simple thing. Wow, uh, I, I knew you guys would be blessed by that. And I, Eileen, I want to give you a little behind the scenes glimpse of what happens in those long term prayers. It brings me to Daniel. 
Daniel was a prayer, a prayer warrior. Um, this man was 15 when he was put in captivity. And for uh, years and years, he prayed three times a day. You know why he got put into the lion's den? was because he was praying when praying was illegal. And he would open his doors and three times a day, he'd just shout out his prayers all the same. This guy knew how to pray. Well, he prayed for the freedom of his people, for protection, for God's deliverance. Years. Now in chapter 10, you get to Daniel, he's 85 years old, which means 70 years. This man prayed three times a day, the same prayers for deliverance. And God says, you know, listen, it's got to happen. And he starts to see that. And we see that within this conflict, he says, listen, the people are going are to be freed, but there's going to be an issue with that. There's going to be a turmoil and a conflict with that. And you see chapter 10 that Daniel is just overwhelmed with grief. And so he goes to God and he says, God, I'm going to fast. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to pray. And he says to God, he says, I'm just going to, for three weeks, he just fasted and prayed and asked God for understanding. He was praying for his people. He was praying for why this was going to happen in the conflict. And then you get down to after three weeks of the 24th day, it says that Daniel lifted his eyes and he saw this breathtaking heavenly being that approached him. And he had all this description of gold faces and, and lightning eyes or eyes like torches or whatever and arms like bronze and voice that echoed like the roar of a crowd, this incredible angelic being. And it's here that we get this glimpse of the heavenly realms of the attendance of our prayer. And it says this, and I just want you to listen to what this being tells Daniel. It's the same message that can be applied to Carl and our prayers that we are longing to see answered. It says this, it says, it's just awesome. It says, and behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, oh, Daniel, man greatly loved Understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he spoke this word to me, I stood up trembling, like you said, stand up, right? And it said this, and then he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words have been heard. Do you get that? How many years did he pray that prayer? 70 years, and he was fasting, and the angel said, listen, so you get it, God hears it the very first day, you are to stay faithful, you're to continue on being faithful to understanding and reaching out to God. When God deems it right to act, he'll send his angel, he will work, but until then, you stay faithful and you pray. Isn't that incredible? I just love that. I know most of you may have an ongoing prayer in your life. Don't Stop praying. Don't give up. Set your heart to understanding God's heart. Stand upright and fear not because you are dearly loved by God. I want to end up this morning. Uh, I want to pray for the persecuted church. Uh, before I do that, I want to show you one more prayer, and it's out of the book of Ephesians. Um, Paul prays in this, this incredible prayer. And if you know much about Paul's writings, he, Every once in a while, as Paul is describing different theological points or going through different moments within uh, just talking and thinking out the Word of God, he just seems to interrupt everything, and he just explodes into this prayer that's just amazing. He goes through Romans, and all of a sudden, he gets to this one point in chapter 15, and he just says, oh my gosh, just how unsearchable are the amazing depths of God, and it seems to interrupt his thoughts. And we see him in Ephesians, and he's describing this love that God God has for his people. And he's saying, listen, boy, I just wish you could get this. I wish you could understand the depth and the height and the length and the width of this love that God has for you. I mean, it's just impossible to comprehend. It surpasses all knowledge. You're just going to have to imagine the love and support that God has for you because you will not be able to capture it here on this world. And as he's speaking this, he just stops and he says this prayer that's amazing. And in history, this prayer has been called a doxology. You guys ever heard that term before? It's made from two Latin words. And this word just means glory words. It means at the point where you are just lost in the thinking and the thoughts of God, that you just can't help but bust out with these glory words. And that's what a doxology is. And I want you to read the glory words of, of Paul here this morning. This is glory prayer. 
It says this, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all, and talk about overstating something here. It's like saying, listen, this he's the super duper, bestest, ultra mega, most amazing, above all else that could ever happen in the whole entire universe. This is our God. To him who is able, that we ask above all that we ask or think, these words are ask means to pray or to imagine. So that in all that we can pray or imagine, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus for all generations, forever and ever. I love it when the Bible says forever and ever. Another redundancy. You know, you just can't say forever. You got to say forever and ever and ever. And that happens over and over in scripture again. But listen to the outline of these glory word prayers, because this is how I want us to pray today. All right. First of all, who do we pray to? Who do we pray to? We pray to God, right? To him, to him, now to him. It's a transitional point. Listen, I am not going to pray about myself. I'm not praying to the air. I'm going to stop and recognize that I pray to the God of the universe, and with this, I pray to a God who is able. In my understanding of my prayer, I understand that God is able to do what? Everything. Anything. Nothing he can't do. This covers logic. This covers discovery. He's saying, listen, I want to dream big here for a minute in my prayer. I want to spend time discovering who you are while maturing in him. Listen, as you guys walk in your faith with God, is your prayer life getting bigger or is it getting smaller? As you grow and as you mature in Christ, a good indication of that maturity is how much you are praying, how much you are spending in time with God in prayer. As I pray to the God that's able, I pray according to the power working in me. Is this in my name that I am praying? Is this my will that I'm praying in? No, I'm praying in the power that is in me. Earlier in Ephesians, Paul talks about this Holy Spirit that is the seal of our redemption. We pray in the power and the name of the Holy Spirit and in Jesus Christ. And it says this, and I pray to him. I pray to him who is able. I pray according to the power and I pray for him to receive I pray for him to receive, and I want him to receive th two things with me. I want him to receive glory, and this is the purpose. I want him to receive glory in the church by Christ Jesus. First of all, he says, I want this to be about the doxology of Christ. This is the glory words, and you see how it says Christ Jesus instead of Jesus Christ? The understanding behind that, it neither takes away from his glory, but sometimes you'll see that in scripture. Sometimes it says Jesus Christ. Sometimes it says Christ Jesus. There's a reason for that. When the emphasis, when it says Jesus Christ, the emphasis is on Christ and Jesus' earthly ministry and all the things that he did. When you see Christ Jesus, the emphasis is on his resurrected power, the resurrected Christ. Listen, as we get close to Christmas, we start unpacking Christmas. We got, I want you to stop and recognize that the church today and the glory of the church today is in the resurrected Christ. We have a king of kings and Lord of lords sitting on the throne. We don't have a baby in a manger or a carpenter or a nomadic a teacher anymore. This is God Almighty that we give him the glory in the church and we give him the glory for eternity. Forever and ever and ever. Listen, is that how your prayers sound? At the very end, it just says, amen, which means make this be or let it be so, or I agree with this. This would be your prayers if you found yourself lost in the goodness of God, like Paul. Lost in the wonderment of God's uh, uh, understanding. If you set your mind to understand him. I want you to start to think about your prayers as if they are glory words, okay? When you pray, your words are entering into glory. They're amazing. They're going to God's ears. Let them be about the glory of God. What I want to do is I want to pray this, for, I want to read this verse together, and then I want to unite our hearts to prayer, and we're going to pray for the persecuted church. We're going to pray, and we're going to use that 
insert in your bulletin for those 10 ways that we could pray for the persecuted church. And then we're going to be done. All right, but would you read this with me? It says in uh, Hebrews 4.16, So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we humble our hearts before you. God, as we stop and we consider that our words become glory words because we are praying to the God Almighty in heaven seated on the throne. Lord, we, call, we come to you not in our strength or our, our abilities, but we come in the name of Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit that lives in us. It's with that that we boldly come before your throne with our requests, with our petitions, with our imaginations, with our desires. God, all those things. And Lord God, we as one church would like to lift up our hearts to those brothers and sisters that are around the world right now facing incredible persecution for your name's sake. Oh God, I pray, Lord, for the persecuted believers that they would have a sense of your presence. God, I pray that they would feel and know their connection to the greater body of Christ. That they would know that there are believers out there praying and lifting them up. We lift up to you the ministries that are going on around the world that are ministering to these churches, ministries like the Rafiki organization and others all around the world, like Stephen, our missionary that we support. Lord, I pray that we would have a recognition of their ministry, Lord, and that we would support them. God, I pray that we have opportunities to share the gospel. I pray for their boldness to make Christ known within their communities. I pray that they will forgive and love those that have taken so much from them. People that have taken their children. People that have taken their, their, their belongings. People that have done so much damage. Would they be able to have the power through your Holy Spirit to say forgive them? Oh God, I pray for their ministry activities. That they will remain undetected by authorities and others who wish to silence them. I pray for those brothers and sisters in North Korea that are cowering in basements and in caves and in places out in fields, just longing to read the word of God with each other. Please protect them. God, I pray that you will be, they will be refreshed through your word, that they will have access to your word, that they will grow in their faith. God, I pray that they'll be strengthened through their fellow believers. Lord, we pray for Nigeria and those who are suffering under the hands of these, uh, uh, these extremists, God. Lord, would you please protect them even now. Protect their children and their families. God, we pray for one another here. We pray for our church and we lift them up to you. Oh, Lord, help us to have eyes to see your purpose. Help us, God, to present our request to you and to set our heart to understanding your will on this earth. I pray that we would rock, walk upright, that we would fear not, that we would boldly come to you with our prayers and our petitions, that we would take everything knowing that this God of ours can do all things. And I pray, Lord, that we would pray like Daniel and we would pray like Eileen and Eileen's grandma and not give up. And in the midst of all of these prayers, we ask that you receive the glory through it all. May you receive glory here at Trinity. May you receive glory in the churches that we had connections with this last five weeks. May you receive glory through this generation that is coming up behind us. Lord, for the churches that are in the United States and churches that are around the world, may you receive glory and honor. Do your name forever and ever. And it's in this that all God's people in agreement said, Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you.